shifters, entrepreneurs on the move, with your host, Amanda Barr, bringing you power-packed 15-minute conversations with entrepreneurs who share their stories of shifting in life and business to keep on the move. Welcome to the show. This is your host, Amanda Barr, and boy, do we have an incredible shifter with us today. I have Hugh Ballou, a transformational leadership strategist and president of Cinevision International and the Nonprofit Exchange. And after 40 years of musical conducting experience, he now works as an executive coach, process facilitator, trainer, and motivational speaker, teaching leaders in many different and diverse fields the fine-tuned skills employed every day by orchestral conductors. He was the author of not just one, but 10 books on transformational leadership and is a recognized expert in working with leaders in religious organizations, businesses, and nonprofit communities. I can't wait to find out more. (laughs) Welcome to the show. I am glad to be here, Amanda. Thanks for the invitation. I know I shared a lot, but I would love for you to share a little bit more about yourself and your passion behind what you do. Well, I've spent a career as a musical conductor. Um, trained and certified as a as a choral conductor, but in mega churches, I had to um, hire orchestras, and I did actually some conducting in Europe and actually where I live in Lynchburg. So, um, a conductor knows how to take a whole bunch of different sounds and a whole bunch of different personalities and unify them with the plan. That's our music, and bring harmony to the group and build a higher performance because we work together. So over the years, I have worked with organizations using what a conductor knows about, well, running meetings is like running rehearsals. We energize people. We don't kill them in meetings. And then we create harmony. We create uh, powerful cultures that perform at a higher standard because they can work together. And so I created my brand combining the word synergy and vision because we create synergy through a common vision, but it's also how we work together in a, in a common common way. So in music, we call that ensemble. The more we work together, the more the better we are at working together. So I've I've taken all the skills of a conductor and I've translated them, transposed them into um, non musical language for those people working in nonprofits, churches, synagogues, and um, I work with multinational business leaders who are challenged especially today with the COVID and trying to figure out how we're going to build high performing cultures. Wow. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of all things musical and fascinated with your connection of how the orchestra relates to business and it, and it is, it's so much um, in alignment. Uh, So thank you for, for taking us down that journey with you and, You know, I'd love to hear um, as you transitioned out, I mean, our show is all about shifting and entrepreneurs, but as you were transitioning from that world, were there any shifts that you um, encountered along the way to where you are now? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I I forgot to say I have a family of CenterVision brands. CenterVision International is how I work with entrepreneurs and and, and mid-cap businesses. CenterVision Leadership Foundation is set up to to do work with nonprofits, and it's a whole different structure. So uh, I create Synergy, and then I have CenterVision Publishing for a magazine that I publish and books and, and that kind of stuff. But I, I was trained as a conductor, but early on, I was an entrepreneur. I bought this little camera store in Madeira Beach, Florida. It was doing $12,000 in sales a year. Back when we sold nickel, this is on the beach, we had postcards, nickel postcards, $20 instamatic cameras, $5 rolls of film. And I took it to a million and a half in sales and pretty much dominated commercial photo and audiovisual sales and et cetera in central Florida because I saw a place to grow it. So I made a pivot from a musician to a business person, but I kept working in church music over the years. And in church music, I hired major orchestras. I did major concerts and became the center of attention in the community. But in my church in 12,000 in Atlanta, I determined, if I set step back, it was the first time in my life I had one job. Entrepreneurs usually do multiple things. But I worked at this mega church, and I decided, hmm, 10% of my job is music. 
90% allows me to make music. So I had 750 people are in this program with 22 different, different musical ensembles. So most of it was organizing things, equipping people, uh, engaging volunteers, engaging staff, and building the common structure so people could work together. So what I find missing in a lot of work that entrepreneurs do, either in for-profit businesses or in for-purpose Texas Amp Enterprises, like a nonprofit, is we don't have the organizational piece to, to let our brilliance shine. So we are in business with a nonprofit or a business because we want to make a difference. We have skills and programs and talent to offer people, but we need to build the infrastructure underneath that so it happens. So you go to a symphony concert and the conductor walks out and raises the baton and people respond and there's magic that happens. Well, behind that, there's a whole lot of work that went into play to make that happen. And that's, that's the 10%. So the blue 1090 rule is 10% is what you know and 90% is what you don't know. So that's where I show up is I help other people figure out what that 90% is that they don't even know they don't know. So we hit the wall or we fall into a ditch because there's things we don't know. So in addition to the books I've, I've created online curriculum for, because I've already been there and made the mistakes, then I have the stuff. That's why they call me an expert. I already made the mistakes. So I've got the, I've got the, the steps that people can take to sort of keep them from falling in those ditches or running into a wall. So that's, that's my calling is to provide systems and structure and skills for those people yeah. who can make a difference in the world. What do you think? I mean, cause you're, you got the experience and you're training others, but what is one of the things that people don't know that they don't know that you see most often? Well, we're creative people, entrepreneurs, you know, I love the I love the question when people say, "Hey, do all of you entrepreneurs suffer from insanity?" And I say, "No, we enjoy it." And so, you know, people think we're crazy because we don't have a job, we don't have a regular paycheck, we're doing something magical. But you know, ultimately, we can create a pretty solid lifestyle. And what we don't know is that the creativity is charged by structure. Let me explain that. A musician is a right-left brain, simultaneous functioner. We function in our left, left brain and our right brain. So we have a, a really rigid structure. Musical Music is highly mathematical, highly structured. So we have to be creative within a structure. So in, in my world, we write our plan. That's our roadmap. Now I'm going from Virginia where I live to St. Louis. I need to have a map to know where I'm going. Now, you may not believe that some men read maps, but some of us do. So there's a road <laughs> map. We're going there. Where are we going to stop? Where you need a hotel? We need a restaurant. So we know when we're going to get there so our relatives know, okay, we're going to be there. So we don't do that in real life. We don't put a plan together to say, here's our arrival destination. And that's our long-term objectives, the vision for our organization. This is where we're going to be. Then we come backwards and we write a tactical plan. Um, I call that a strategic plan. In nonprofit, I've created a pr proprietary um, process called a solution map. Where do you want to be and how are you going to get there? So what we don't know when we're starting an enterprise is we need to have that structure in place. So we need to know if we hire team members, what skills do we need and what priority do we put people into place? Because sometimes we hire people out of order and we're paying for the less productive people when we need to put the more productive people in place first that helps us provide the, the, the cash flow for the rest of them. So what we don't know is the importance of the strategy, and what we really don't know is how to take that piece of paper, which is the strategy, and integrate it into performance. So that's what a conductor does. we got this piece of paper with dots, and then we work to integrate it with the orchestra, with the choir, into this magnificent thing that you hear in the audience is music. So those are the two big blind spots that people don't know, and then that's what hurts them. I love it. I mean, coming and working in the world, and I'm a, I'm a unique combo because I actually really love the creative side, but I'm also operational, just minded. Everything needs to have function and order. <laughs> so you're, I'm just smiling because I'm loving what you're sharing, and it's so true, having that roadmap and, and knowing where you're going. Now, you – 
Um, I also want to bring up, because I know that you work with nonprofits and you're working with companies in different, different organizations, but you also work with the youth. Could you tell us a little bit more about the great work you're doing with the youth? Um, yes. Um, part of my life, three years, I taught middle school music. I learned everything about leadership in those three years because most of those middle school <laughs> students didn't want to be in a music class. So I had to, I had, to had to be very creative and engaging. So, um, But at the end, there were some kids that were really inspired and cut through the uh, the persona that we shouldn't be doing, especially the boys. It wasn't really a guy saying to do music, but here's a male teaching you. So leaders are influencers, and we massively influence young people. And I, I served a church long enough to – I worked with the children and youth, and then they went away to college and came back. And the fruition of my work was seen as they matured over the next 10, 10 years or so. Um, I do, in conjunction with a, a group in Dallas, Texas um, – uh, philanthropy kids, we do uh, workshops, we do conferences for um, kids teaching them about philanthropy and volunteerism and entrepreneurship. It's called PAVE. So we hosted one a few months ago and we had two groups. One group was 13 to 22 and they were just amazing in the stuff they were doing. There were two girls that started from Dallas, a paper for water charity. And in, in, as teenagers, they said, oh, we've raised $2 million by folding origami paper and having teams follow them. We've raised $2 million for water charities around the world, and they've actually been there and seen them. So that's just one of the stories, and they inspired other teenagers. Now, the second group, which came later with their parents, was seven years old at 12. And they had so many creative ideas of how they could show up and be philanthropists when most kids don't even know how to spell philanthropy or more and don't know what it is. So I think um, <laughs> when I was in taught middle school, I did full production of Godspell with sixth graders. And people said to me, well, that's hard. How did you do it with sixth graders? And I said, well, I never told them it was hard. I just said, let's do it. And so I think hmm. we, we tend to put bricks on the heads of kids and say, oh, you you're, can only function at this level when in fact we should take them off and let them go to the level that they're capable of functioning. And so I have, I have uh, been re my fire for inspiring um, teenagers and children um, is been ignited in my seventies to just make a huge difference. So we're going to be doing another youth and philanthropy conference. And uh, I bet you we'll have a much larger, we have about 65 uh, youth participating. I think we'll probably double that next time. I love it. I mean, the kids, I think when, when we believe in them and they can believe in themselves, um, so much is possible for our younger generation coming through. So I love the work you're doing. I know like even just learning and, and working in the nonprofit space and understanding that even more is, is incredible. And you, and you also have a magazine, if I understand correct. Um, you, you have, it's called the nonprofit performance 360. Can you tell us more I about that? Yes, um, I lift up stories of um, uh, it's four leaders that are in the trenches doing the work, and it's inspiration. And you can find it at uh, nonprofitperformance.org, nonprofitperformance.org. And it's 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 not an advertorial piece. There are people that are professionals that actually have resources to teach business principles to nonprofits, and they're nonprofit leaders who have accomplished something amazing. And they want to tell a story. So some leaders want to know how to, and some leaders want to be inspired by a story. Yes, somebody did this, and that's great inspiration. Um, my fourth book is Transforming Power, and it's stories of leaders that led transformations. And so the the the, the uh, style of leadership that I champion was 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 articulated in the 80s by two writers, Burns and Bass, and it's called transformational leadership. And my nonprofit, Center Vision, transforms leaders, transforming organizations, transforming lives. So I'm in the transformation business. So the magazine um, is, a, is a power magazine that um, has a lot of diverse articles in it to inspire the leader. And it just sits on their bookcase because they're not dated. And the stories are timeless. They are usable in any generation. So I'm real proud of that magazine. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, I've 
looked at it and, and what the stories you're sharing. And I love that it's timeless because uh, our stories, they live on and, and they're inspirational and being in the nonprofit space, it's usually about touching, touching others. And you also have a unique way of approaching the nonprofit space. I'd love for you to share a little bit about about that, about the social side and, and what, what that means to you. What do you what do you notice in particular that's different? I would I would love to hear what what stood out to you because I, I I break all the rules. <laughs> I, I, do, I do things <laughs> backwards from other people. What what stood out particularly that, that, that you'd like me to articulate? Well, yeah, you you mentioned something about um, when we spoke um, in regards to uh, social entrepreneurship that it should be a certain way, and so I just was kind of intrigued and would like you to maybe share a little bit about sure. what what's the way it should be with a nonprofit. Sure, um, we are social entrepreneurs. We we are impacting people's lives, and the value of our work is stated in in terms of impact. Yeah, we may have had so many people come to great concerts. Yes, we may have uh, had children uh, go through education classes for art. Yes, we might have fed so many people. But what difference did it make in their lives? And so many of us don't think about that result. Okay, we count numbers. Okay, what's the significance? Um, You know, we can count everything, but what counts? What really counts? And it, what counts is what difference we make in people's lives. So it's really thinking about different metrics. Is this the metric of transforming somebody's lives and helping them um, make a difference? And just because you give somebody a meal doesn't mean you've, you've impacted their life. Yes, they didn't die or starve to death, but have they been able to be able – like like the old adage, you can give a hungry person a fish or you can teach them how to fish. So right. our whole methodology with nonprofit leaders and organizations is help them install business systems so they can upgrade their teams and their processes to impact more people's lives and to attract more money. And the money is attracted by that impact statement. We, we have mm-hmm. to, in any kind of business, entrepreneurs, we really, the one of the blind spots is we don't really know how to talk about the value, the unique value proposition. In either a for-profit or for-purpose nonprofit, we don't know how to talk about the unique value we bring. It's called a, in business, a strategic selling position and generally a unique value proposition. What is unique about us that we offer that nobody else does that's compelling for us to choose us? And in the case of nonprofits, that's the trigger for people to say, oh, I like what you do and I want to support it with my time, my talent, and my money. So, so we've learned leadership wrong, um, and we've inherited systems that aren't working now. They really aren't working now. They weren't working before. So it's time for us to pivot. You know, I pivoted from being this, this guy that waved the stick, and I was in Huntsville, Alabama, and I went on my own to be a facilitator and then actually went into executive coaching because teams could develop ideas and concepts about where they could go, and the leader didn't know how to take it there. So I went into working with a leader to be able to empower them. And, and where I had left working in, in music ministry, people said, oh, you're the song leader. What do you know about leadership? And I said, well, I'm a conductor. I know about leadership. And, but they yeah. didn't know underneath all of what they saw me do in conducting, there was a whole infrastructure that, that had to exist to, to let that happen. So the, the, the difference in how I help nonprofits is help them install business principles and work with partnerships with the business leaders in the area where they are, because it's good for business to be a philanthropist and work with your nonprofit. And certainly nonprofit leaders can learn from business leaders. Absolutely. I think all that information is just so valuable. Um, and, And I just love how you kind of bring it together and really what is that impact that you're leaving and I think everybody um, listening from whatever entrepreneurial angle you're coming from, you can walk away and go, yeah, what is that? What are we really doing for somebody and how are we really touching people's lives? Now, I mean, you've been touching people's lives for years and you've written, like we said, not just one, but 10 books. And we could probably talk 
for hours about all your different books, but I would love for you to share maybe your top favorite book that you've written and why. Well, the one I referred to, which is one I didn't publish, it was published by one of the United Methodist Publishing uh, House imprints. Uh, it's called Transforming Power, and you can find it on Amazon, um, Cokesbury Online, my site. But Transforming Power is stories. And I reached out to about 20 people, really high-level influencers. Not one person turned me down. And this wasn't, I didn't pay people. I said, you want to be in the book? So they gave me stories. And I actually got the contract with the publisher on a, on a verbal. I, I said to the decision maker, hey, I'm going to do this book. Do you want to publish it? They said, yeah. So I didn't have a contract until I took them the manuscript, which was really backwards. I just do, like I said, I do things backwards. And so <laughs> the stories were transforming for me to read. And I put that story in there about the, the, the church that I told you. And it's, it's to inspire people that, yes, one person – can be a catalyst for transformation. People are afraid of change. It's a funny word, change. But transformation, yeah, that's more of an empowering, empowering piece. So my other books are how-to books. You know, my first one is uh, Moving Spirits, Building Lives, and I have a companion workbook for it. And it's it's basically a primer on transformational leadership. Um, and then Building High Performance Teams is the how-to book to motivate your team. So they're all niches in what people don't think about in leadership. But that's my favorite book because it's stories that warm the heart and inspire you and actually encourage you to say, I can do that. I can do that because you can't. Yeah, I think it is. It's so inspirational uh, to read those stories. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and hopefully those listening, go, go grab it and go read those inspirational stories. And you know, you've had so much experience and so many things happen in your life, but in terms of, like, what do you wish um, everybody knew about what you do? I know you shared about a lot of what you do, but is there anything else that you just, it would be incredible if they just knew this little little thing about, about your business or about what you can bring to the table or what's even possible for them? I, yeah, yeah. Um, I um. I've been doing this work actively for 32 years. You know, I did it before that internally in the, the large organizations where I served, and then people invite me to come work with them because they thought I was real smart because I served this big group, but it was sort of training ground. But but um, I used to, to to want it more than people wanted for themselves because there's a there's a work you have to work to achieve achieve your own success. You can't skip out of the work part. Um, like rehearsing for a concert, you've got to do the hard work or it's not going to be a good concert. So what um, what I wish people knew is I do have an unfailing belief in their success, even when they doubt their own success. But what I'll do is I will back somebody through those doubts because they're committed to sticking with it. And I don't always get to talk about that, but if somebody says, I want to figure it out, I'm going to stay with it, then I'm going to stick with it, even though it doesn't seem like they're going to make it. Um, magic things happen when people stay with it and they're persistent. And we go from believing we can succeed, like Wayne Dyer used to say, to knowing we're going to succeed because you've done the work. And the hardest part of the work we do, the heavy lifting part of the work we do, is thinking and learning to think in new ways. And that's hard for all of us. But when we, we are able to open our brain to some new ideas and new possibilities, it's quite magical. So I wish people knew that I, I would stay with them as long as they're committed to their own success. It's incredible to hear that from you. And, I, and you know, I think if more people were like that, this world would be even better place. <laughs> people to really stick with somebody and, and be there for them and, so thank you for sharing that. And I, I know you've shared so many nuggets, but as we wrap up this show, because um, we could talk for hours, but obviously we've got to wrap it up. But if you were to give one last, as I like to call, the shifter wisdom um, and how to keep people that are shifting and keep them on the move, to keep them moving forward. I mean, what you gave was already incredible, but if there was anything else you would say that has kept you on the move or would keep them on the move, I'd love to hear, and I know they would too. That's a great question, and I asked the same on my Nonprofit Exchange podcast, and I 
I'm always curious as to how people respond to that. And now you're asking me to do it. Um, I, I think you, you, we really need to equip ourselves for success and never stop working on yourself and never limit the potential that you have. There is potential that we all have that we can unlock. And so it, it first means where do we want to go? Define the target of where we want to be with whatever you lead. This is where I want to be. So it's really clear so people can track you and support you. And then establish your principles. I am a pleaser. I want to do things to please people. That's wrong. I want to have really clear guiding principles to make decisions by. And then people will respect that. And I've seen that play out over and over. If you know for sure something is true, you know for sure something is possible, write it down. That's your guiding principle. This is where we're going to be. That's the power that will allow you to get there. Amazing. And I think that we can all all do that. Those that are listening, myself included, <laughs> just keep that in mind to go and write it down. Hugh, you've shared so many good things, and I'm so thankful to have you on the podcast, sharing your story, inspiring us all, inspiring me. I know those that are listening are probably going to want to know more about how they can find you, how they can find your books. How can they get in touch with you? Well, um, you can Google my name. <laughs> you can find <laughs> Forbes article about me, all kind of stuff. The community is nonprofitcommunity.org, Nonprofit community.org and my website is my name Hugh Ballou it's B-A-L-L-O-U dot com and so that's where they can find me um, the, the Center Vision Foundation is nonprofitcommunity.org and it's just a page that explains the community if you want to go to the rest of it you just click on the logo it'll take you to the rest of the website there's just a lot of stuff there and then Hugh Ballou just sort of is an overview of what I do and so I'd love to talk to anybody about leadership. Amazing. Well, thank you again so much today for for sharing and your story. And thank you for being on the show. I'm so honored, Amanda. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. And for all those listening out there, keep on the move. We hope you enjoyed the episode today. We appreciate each one of you for listening and hope you left inspired and motivated to keep on the move. If you think this episode might help or inspire someone else, please share. Don't forget to subscribe and keep in the loop to hear more incredible stories of entrepreneurs like yourself on the move. Thank you for our supporters, RTB Capital Group, Financial Powerhouse, Callcast, and Power Podcasting. Now, get out there and keep on the move.